Okay, I want to uh, welcome uh, all attendees to coming into the uh, second webinar in English of the Immunization Monitoring Academy. Take your time uh, to, uh, if this is your first time for a IMA webinar, a uh, warm welcome. If you're a return uh, visitor, um, a warm welcome as well. And uh, if you, there are, you see questions or, co or comments from your uh, peers who are here for the first time, uh, please help them. That's the spirit of the uh, uh, WHO Scholar Program, which this uh, IMA is a part of. Uh, so we have 221 people who are already uh, in the room. So I hope you can uh, you can hear me. Uh, we'll be um, you'll be also seeing us on the uh, on the webcams. Uh, let us know if that causes uh, bandwidth uh, problems, internet problems for you. We may turn off the webcams if too many people are having uh, are experiencing problems. You should see on your screen. So I am actually connecting today from uh, Abidjan in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. If there's anybody uh, in the uh, webinar. Uh, from uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Um, uh, thank you for welcoming me here and in Geneva at the WHO headquarters are uh, Ahmed Reza Hosseinpour and Jan Gravendonk. Uh, so um, you can see on the screen, yes, I see uh, uh, webinar attendees who are here for the second time uh, already know what to do. If you follow the instruction, it's very simple. If you can take your phone, if you're connecting from your desktop, I suggest you take out your phone, uh, go to your web browser on your phone, uh, Chrome or Safari or whatever it is you're using, um, type the address www.menti.com, and then uh, you'll be asked for six number code 581116, type that, and um, then you will see that you are asked what country you're connecting from. And so what you are seeing, somebody typed hello. <laughs> so uh, that is uh, nice. But uh, what we're actually asking you to do is to type the name of the country that you are connecting from. So for those of you who are looking at the chat, uh, some of you are typing the country name into the chat window. Uh, so that is fine. It's uh, nice to see greetings there too. But what we want you to do is, is actually go to the website, menti dot com and then use the code 58 11 16. So if you've never done this before, maybe slightly confusing, but as you can see, 36 of you have already figured out how to do it. You go to the website menti.com and you use the code 58 11 16. This is how we make the this uh, webinar interactive. This is one of the two ways in which you'll be able to interact with the panelists throughout the presentation. Jan Grevendonk has prepared uh, questions for you to answer, to consider, and everyone will be able to participate and share their feedback, share their input on key questions in this uh, during this, uh, this webinar. The second tool, which we'll be introducing uh, after we've gone through Mentimeter, is uh, the Q&A tool. And whether you're on the phone or desktop, you should see an item, a button called Q&A. And if you um, click on that button, this is completely different from Mentimeter. So please do not get confused between the two. The Q&A button is there for only one purpose. It is for you to submit and vote on the best questions for Jan Gravendonk and Ahmed Reza Hossein Poor. So, uh, in the um, Q&A window, you will see there's an option to actually submit a question, and then you can also upvote uh, specific questions that you like. But for now, focus on Mentimeter. Go to menti.com and use the code 581116. We already have almost 100 people who are um, uh, who are who have figured out how to go to menti.com, how to type in the code, and then how to put in their country name. And you can see the larger, this is a word cloud, so the larger the, um, the type, uh, the more people have typed in this, uh, this, uh, this country name. So you can see that the, right now, the biggest uh, contingent of participants is coming from uh, India, with also large groups from Nigeria, Pakistan, Ghana, Cameroon, uh, Kenya. So please uh, keep going, we are almost uh, 300, uh, 300 attendees who've joined the room and only 112 of you, which is uh, actually quite a bit, uh, have uh, joined. And I want to really salute uh, the uh, WHO Scholar companists. So they, are, uh, they have completed at least one WHO Scholar course and have volunteered to support their peers, their colleagues in the new courses. There are um, 
170 WHO scholar accompanists. Many of them are in the room. If um, I could ask them to introduce themselves in the chat, uh, let us know who you are. And it's really a testament to this uh, WHO scholar program that's been running for two years, building on successive courses uh, to lead to, uh, to, to benefit uh, this one and the others that we are currently running. So go to menti.com, use the code 58-11-16, and um, yeah, type your, the name of your country, make yourself heard. We have almost half of the um, attendees who have now uh, typed in the name of their country. We still have, okay, Nigeria, I believe, has overtaken India in terms of the number of uh, participants today. Um, we also have large contingents from Pakistan, Ghana, um, <coughs> Cameroon, Myanmar, uh, South Africa. Someone has typed wonderful meeting. I would actually love to go to that country. So the, what we're asking you to do is to type in the name of the country. Um, so, and thank you for those typing in the chat, but if you want to make your voice heard, you'll want to go to menti.com. And, um, and I see there is a question actually from George Kibike. So uh, is it possible to access the first data improvement plan? I assume you mean the webinar. So I'll give you the, uh, uh, so the, um, uh, the information and the resources from the webinar were shared with everybody who attended. Um, and we are now, <clears throat> and I'll give you the quick link to actually get to those uh, resources. Uh, and we'll be doing the same thing. So one of the most common questions is, um, um, is will the slide deck be available here um, or after the session? The answer is yes. So do not worry if you want, if you would like access to the resources uh, and you would like to um, look at the recording, especially if you had a connection problem or if you're not, were not able to attend the entire session, this will be ma made available to you uh, the day after the webinar. All right, so we now have 158 people. Um, so over, we'd love to hear a quick word of introduction from uh, Jan and Ahmed Reza, just to, so you can introduce yourselves before I'll share more details, more practical details about this uh, webinar. Yes, let me start maybe. Uh, thank you for all uh, being there again, so numerous. Uh, congratulations to Nigeria and India for being the biggest contingents, uh, but also special uh, thanks to the one person from the USA who uh, is most motivated because it's 5 a.m. I think there. So still, uh, that's, that's kudos for uh, joining this webinar. So my name is Jan Kirivnok. I work in WHO. And if you joined last week, you have seen me here as well. Uh, I'll let Ahmed introduce himself. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ahmed Azofo Simpul. And I'm leading the health equity monitoring work at WHO uh, headquarters. Thank you both. So shall we look at the, so we have 167 people. So half of you have figured out how to use menti.com. Um, you go to the website, you can use your phone or you can just switch to the browser and use the code 581116. You should still be able to hear what is going on in the webinar, even if you have to switch uh, apps. So again, this is a participatory event. We're not uh, just asking you to sit and listen. We also want you to ask questions, participate in the Mentimeter uh, in the Menti polls uh, to ask a question. This is different from using Mentimeter, so please do not confuse the two. Um, you go to the Q&A, there you look for the Q&A button, and in Q&A, you can submit your questions and vote on the questions that you feel should be answered by the, pa by the panelists, by Jan and his guests. So the Q&A button is very important. It is not for replying to Menti meter polls, but it is to submit the uh, su substance questions, what you want answered. You do not need to ask if, you will, if the, the resources, the presentation or the video will be available. We will make it available to everyone who uh, participated in the webinar. Uh, you can see the other ground rules here. There is a raise hand item. If time allows, um, you know, we, will, we may turn to some of you to actually ask your question uh, and unmute your microphone but do not be disappointed with over 300 attendees. We may not be able to answer your question today, but Jan Grevendonk has already set up a tinyurl.com. You can see the address, uh, the last bullet in the slide with the IMA resources. So all of the resources from this and other webinars. All right. And uh, 
this just to again emphasize there are two different things um, in zoom this is where you listen to the webinar this is where you can chat and you can um, uh, see the videos of the panelists but and the most important thing in terms of being inter interactive is to look for the Q&A button uh, so you can ask submit your questions or give a thumbs up to other people's questions. Uh, the questions that uh, receive the most thumbs up will be the first ones that I will turn to uh, and submit to uh, Jan and his guest uh, to be uh, for, for their consideration. Uh, Mentimeter is uh, something that we, half of you figured out how to use a few minutes ago um, to actually you know, respond to specific questions and polls and it's a way to participate more actively. So the best one, the good practice is to have uh, Zoom on your laptop and then to have use your phone to access uh, menti.com and then use the code 581116. So please do not ask if, you're, if the resources, presentation and videos will be available. Yes, they will be. Um, but do use the Q&A to submit uh, substance questions about what you really want to know, if there's anything you want the presenters to clarify or follow up on, if you have con you know, sort of country specific questions and would like their, uh, their inputs or advice, that is why you use the Q&A tool. So I hope that is clear and you, know, uh, you cannot break anything, but please do try to be careful. All right. So thank you, Reda, for the introduction and getting everybody on board with the Menti and the Zoom. Uh, I think by the end of the series of webinars, we'll have it figured out. Um, so first of all, what are the objectives for this meeting? We wanted to give you like a general update on immunization coverage and equity, um, explain how national data are collected and used at global level, and point you to the tools, data, and visualizations that, that might be really useful for you, especially if you do the scholar course uh, on making a data improvement plan. You will have a, a bunch of tools at your disposal uh, at the global level, but even with data for your country at the national and the subnational level. Um, I also kind of invited Ahmed Reza because the hot topic right now is looking beyond average coverage and really look at kind of special populations and equity, uh, not just as a way to improve equity, but also as a way to improve coverage because like improving coverage will uh, increasingly involve uh, looking for the underserved and really finding the, the, the groups of people that are not as well vaccinated as the average. Um, small agenda, so we'll start with a quiz on Mentimeter, so get your phone ready. Uh, then I'll give a short um, state of the situation of the global uh, coverage and equity situation. Uh, and then we'll give uh, half an hour to Ahmed Reza to talk to the health equity assessment and related uh, resources. Um, after that, we'll talk a little bit about the processes that explain us on that explain how we actually get all this data through the joint reporting form. Um, we'll also talk about the WHO and UNICEF estimates of national immunization coverage, um, which always raise a lot of questions. And finally, I wanted to tell you where we actually put the data at your disposal. So where can you go find the data? We we realize at this at this point uh, it might be a little bit shattered. It might be all over the place. Uh, there's different places where you can go look for immunization data. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, where the data actually is hidden. Uh, so we said we start with a quiz um, just to uh, warm up. Um, many of this, many of you should know this, but what do you think um, is the right answer? How many children are not vaccinated with at least three doses of DTP containing vaccine? So Penta 3 or, or DTP 3 or uh, some other combination vaccine. Is it 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, or 50 million people, children that are not vaccinated every year? So this is a year of the yearly cohort, right? Right. Um, so more than half of the people who have voted so far think it's 20 million. Uh, but there's also quite a few who think it's 30 million, um, 10 million, 40 million, and also 50 million. Um, we'll see the answer in a moment, so stay tuned for that. I'll just give it a little bit more time. We are 130 to vote, but the clear winner seems to be 20 million uh, children. The next question is maybe a bit more difficult because it's less politicized, but what do you think is the main driver of inequity in immunization? Is it the sex of the child? Is it whether the child lives in an urban versus rural context? 
is it the economic status so poor versus rich or is it the birth order of the child whether it's a um, the first, second, sixth child in the in the family, and uh, we'll come back uh, a lot to this. So a lot of people think it's urban versus rural of the people who already voted. Uh, the sex of the child is one person, uh, birth order one person, and economic status uh, forty seven. So. Uh, it seems to be between urban versus rural and economic status with urban versus rural um, most likely. So again, we'll come back to that and there might be uh, answers that kind of, uh, that you might not expect. Um, last quiz, you know, like in uh, two years ago, we first uh, start collecting district level data. Um, so from all these districts in uh, 120 countries that reported uh, how many districts do you think have a coverage over 100% for at least one vaccine? Is it less than 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 20%, 20 to 30 or even more than 30%? So just to clarify, for any vaccine, an administrative coverage of more than 100%. Right, so most people uh, think it's between 5 and 10% of districts. Um, and all the other answers are uh, a little bit spread out so again, we'll also have an answer to that. So uh, please pay attention so, yeah, as we go forward. There's mm -hmm. just a question. Uh, what does it mean equity in relation to immunization services besides the coverage? This is a um, question from Andy Mubekele. Yes, we'll come, we'll come back to that uh, when we have the session on equity, but basically um, equity, in, equity in health in, basically uh, means unjustified inequalities in coverage. That's how we identify a little bit equity. So if there's a population group that has a lower outcome in terms of coverage than other population groups, um, that seems to be unjustified. We call that an in inequity. So okay. it is very much related to coverage, but instead of looking at the average coverage, it looks at uh, coverage in specific groups, uh, whether those are uh, females or males or uh, poor people or rich people or urban or poor or, or whatever they are. And I'm looking at the master to correct me. Thank you. Right. Okay, so anyway, you think that uh, there are districts with estimate coverage over 1%, but limited to 5 to 10%. We'll come back to that in a minute. So first of all, uh, a lot of you m might have seen this uh, slide. Uh, coverage is stagnating at around 85% for the last um, almost uh, seven years now. We don't seem to be able to increase that. Uh, there are 20 million unimmunized children, as you see on the bars on the bottom. Half of those children actually live in Afro. Um, so yes, uh, 20 million was the right answer to that, uh, to that uh, question. And Afro is the region um, with most unimmunized children, 10 million out of 20 million. Um, there's another part to this story though. Like, first of all, we have to acknowledge that the birth cohort keeps on increasing, especially in Afro. Actually, the, the birth cohort is increasing very fast in Afro which means that Afro is actually also the continent that vaccinates more children every year, uh, where the other continents are just, need, or the other regions just need to uh, keep up with what they were doing. So um, last year, 2017, was actually a year that we uh, vaccinated as a community, as a program, uh, most children ever, like 127 million children. But of course, there's still the 20 million that we need to focus on, which are the ones that are not vaccinated. Um, we can try to look at that and see uh, which ones are completely left out and which ones drop out by um, looking at the DTP 1 to 3 uh, dropout. So what we see is that 10% uh, of children, 2 out of 20, if you look at that uh, series of 20 children on the bottom right, uh, so 2 out of the 20 are never reached by, this, by, the, by the health service or the immunization service at all. And then there's one child that was actually started on DTP 1 but didn't uh, finalize the schedule, so dropped out. Um, over time or opted out or whatever that was. Um, so I think the role for data and the role for immunization programs is now really uh, to, well, first of all, we should congratulate ourselves in reaching all these so children, yeah, but also- We have a quick question from um, uh, Adam Haji who asks, what is the difference between dropout and left out? Yes. 
So uh, to reiterate that the left out children are the ones who are never accessed by the children. So they didn't even start any vaccine dose, not DTP1, not probably not BCG, and probably also not measles or other doses. So the zero dose children, uh, they're also called, or the left outs or the, uh, the people that never access health uh, services office, uh, often. The dropouts are... The dropouts are the ones that uh, start a schedule, but then don't uh, see it through until the third dose of DTP3. So there's a follow-up question from uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Bakr, WHO companies, who asks, what's the difference between left out and unimmunized? Can we use it interchangeably? Um, yes, unvaccinated, left out, zero dose children are all words that do the rounds. They mean the same thing. The dropouts uh, are the ones uh, who drop out. Um, next slide I'm, I'm, I'm showing you it might be a bit complicated, but I still wanted to show it. Um, it's how we kind of track uh, GVAP targets by country. So as you know, the GVAP, the Global Vaccine Action Plan, uh, is uh, an ambitious plan that uh, aims for 90% coverage in all the countries in the world. So what we did to kind of support that is we dev developed this visualization that shows uh, country by country, region by region, and even at the global level, if we are reaching those levels. So what you see here, that even at the global level, we haven't reached 90% uh, coverage yet for any vaccine apart from the first dose of DTP. Um, you see, for example, in the South Asian region, it's almost the same, a little bit better maybe than global. But you can also see that that region uh, has a little bit less uptake of the newer vaccines, such as uh, PCV and Rota. So these are visualizations that I just wanted to show you. It might be too complex to really uh, go into much depth here, uh, but it's kind of a one, um, one glance view on the immunization status in a country. What you see, for example, in Bangladesh, a very high performing country, is that they reach GVAP targets, so they have maintained uh, green dots, meaning more than 80% of, uh, more than 90% of vaccination for at least um, two years. Uh, Nepal, also a country that is getting there. Um, so I won't explain too much, but we'll be happy to kind of follow up with questions. Uh, we also kind of collected the district level data. So what we see, first of all, first of all is a lot of variety in uh, district data. Um, so if you look at the X axis, uh, so the uh, horizontal axis here, um, it goes from zero all the way to more than 100%. And what you see, for example, on the first graph, Ethiopia, it starts really from zero. Then you have a lot of districts that are between zero and 15%. I mean, you have a bit of everything until you hit that 100% line. And then you also have a number of districts uh, over 100%. Um, the same for Pakistan uh, and, and India. So the purple dots are the ones over 100%. And the answer to the question, there's actually more than 40% of districts that have at least one antigen over 100%. So that is really uh, something that casts doubt on the, the quality of that data, but it's, that's what it is right now. Um, one final remark I want to make, if you look at Pakistan, you know that big uh, orange bubble there. So the bubbles become bigger as the cohort increases and the, the vertical axis is actually the size of the cohort. Uh, what you see there is Karachi, uh, so a district or second level at min level, uh, where you have 500,000 uh, children almost, which would make it the 50th country in the world, right? So just to say that this level is actually very important. Um, um, the final question, what is most important uh, in terms of driver of inequities? Ahmed will say more of that. But if you just look at the differences between uh, survey estimates, uh, and I got this data from HEAT, from the database that Ahmed has, you see that there's actually in those surveys very little difference between fem male and female outcomes. So the difference is actually statistically not uh, significant for any of these surveys, and it goes either way. So we don't really have evidence to say that uh, gender discrimination would be an issue in immunization at least. Um, difference, difference between rural and urban is there. So um, basically urban areas are doing better in terms of immunization outcomes than rural. Um, but there is an even bigger difference between uh, the poor and the rich. And actually in one analysis that Ahmed did in his latest publication is that at least for the priority countries, so 10 Gavi priority countries, all of the difference is explained by the economic status. So if you're equally poor, uh, you're equally bad off whether you live in an urban or a rural area. And in some cases, for example, in India, you're actually worse off in an urban area than in the rural areas. So it seems to be that uh, overwhelmingly, um, 
uh, being poor is probably uh, really a big explanation of uh, having less chance of being fully vaccinated. Um, also like a segue to into Ahmed's uh, slides, just to say that national and district average can mask big differences. So on the right, I put a famous picture of a favela in Sao Paulo in Brazil, where you can see like a very wealthy um, building on the right and a slum area on the left. And that is probably the same district. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the people in, the, in that same district, they don't share the same characteristics. So averages in that district don't, see, don't say anything. Uh, on the left, I just put a few priority countries or kind of interesting countries. Uh, and also to illustrate that an average doesn't really mean anything. When we talk, for example, about Nigeria, the national coverage might be less than 50%, but we see that there's five worlds in Nigeria. You know, they're the very rich people. Mm -hmm. They have immunization outcomes that are almost as good as in um, the Western world. Uh, and the very poor on the left, they have almost no chance of being vaccinated. Um, something else that is interesting there is, for example, a country like Pakistan with actually uh, nationally quite reasonable coverage where you have like the least, um, the most marginalized or the poorest group uh, that has immunization outcomes as if they lived in Nigeria or Angola or Chad, right? Here you have countries that are uh, equitably uh, poor performing like Chad or equitably high performing like Tanzania also. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ahmed Reza to talk about uh, his work on- uh, So yeah, before healthcare. you do, we have yeah. some questions uh, piling up. We have uh, 36 uh, questions, 14 of them have been answered, four were off topic or, or were dismissed. Uh, so the, I'll share the two questions with the um, greatest number of votes. We, they only have seven votes, given that we have 373 people in the room. Um, do use the little uh, hand with the raised thumb. That's when you click on that, you're voting for a question. So uh, Mohamed Imran Qureshi's question with seven votes. How can we establish a relationship between equity and high risk population immunization coverage? Yeah, can we hold off on that question? Because we're now going to have the session on uh, inequality monitoring and maybe I think it would be great to answer that question again after that session by Ahmed. Okay, great. Should, any other questions or let, let's actually go on and then have some questions after this next session. Yeah, the only other question with 10 votes is, uh, how is the WHO UNICEF estimate done? But again, well, that's- yes, There are no. slides on that and we'll come back on that uh, later. Okay, so my talk today has two parts. In the first part, I'm going to give you a PowerPoint presentation with two objectives. First, why uh, health inequality monitoring and data disaggregation is important, and then what WHO has done about it. And in the second part, I'm going to give you a live demonstration on a toolkit that we developed, Health Equity Assessment Toolkit, that basically uses interactive ways to analyze and report on health inequality. Okay. So uh, as Ian explained, basically, for any evidence-based uh, decision-making, uh, we need to have the complete knowledge of the situation. And we cannot just rely on the averages, which basically may mask the variation in the circumstances that we are assessing. So if we do so, we may take wrong actions, as what happened to this guy who decided to cross the river just based on relying on the sign showing only the average depth of the river. So the same thing applies to uh, health topic to immunization. And at the same time, we need to look at both average and variation within the population. So, in sustainable development agenda, equity is central with the leave no one behind aspiration. 
it is basically reflected explicitly in uh, Sustainable Development Goal 10, which actually calls for reducing inequality within and between countries. And it's also reflected in SDG 1, 4, and 5. In the health goal, we call for ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages, which basically promotes health equity. And more specifically, in the SDG target 3.8, which calls for universal health coverage. We basically looking at uh, progressive realization, which is tracked through monitoring health equity. So that's the way in the SDG goal, we look at health inequality. In the SDG target 17.18, which is basically the means uh, for uh, implementing SDG goals, there is a specific targets uh, that basically calls for building capacities in the countries uh, to use disaggregated data that are reliable, timely, and uh, with quality data. Also at WHO, in the upcoming year, we will have our new global program of work, which is WHO broad strategy for the next five years. And that explicitly basically calls for promoting disaggregating data, including immunization data uh, by different dimensions of inequality like sex, income, disability, ethnicity, and so on. And it's quite important to basically strengthen equity-oriented health information systems in the countries. In that sense, then we will be able to collect health inequality data, analyze them, and report them to different target audiences so we can make sure that we will have equity-oriented policies, programs, and practices. Knowing the importance of health inequality monitoring, WHO has developed the full package uh, of tools and resources for data disaggregation and to use it for building capacities in the countries and also at global level. So in this slide, you can show different tools that can be used at global and national level and through the components for uh, monitoring, which is it starts from collecting data through analysis and reporting. So I'm just going to refer very briefly to some of the documents, some of the resources that we developed. So the first one is WHO Health Equity Monitor. Uh, that's the WHO platform of disaggregated data, global base, uh, global database for disaggregated data that's established in 2013, but we updating it annually, once or twice. And currently, it's one of the largest global database on health inequality data that includes data from uh, two international, three international household surveys, a demographic uh, and health survey, mix and RHS, reproductive health survey. And it covers 111 countries and mainly indicators from reproductive, maternal, and child health, including immunization data, disaggregated by six dimensions of inequality, economic status, education, place of residence, which is urban, rural, provinces or region within countries, child sex, and women's age. We also provide in the health equity monitor country profiles, which are interactive, and many other interactive visuals that could tell the stories in different topics, including immunization. And that's quite useful in the sense that it's effective way of communication and users can play with the data and choose whatever they want very quickly and easily. The other thing that we do is basically we produce uh, global thematic reports. Some of them you can see here in this slide. So we already developed two global reports for immunization. Uh, the first one was looking at the state of inequality, meaning that what's the latest situation of inequality in immunization globally or 
basically mainly low middle income countries for which we have data and how inequality has changed over time. And the last report that came out last July, we actually looked at the associated factors explaining inequality in 10 priority countries based on the criteria that a global alliance for vaccine has. So that was the thing that also we do at global level. At country level, uh, we have two approaches basically to build capacity in the countries for health inequality monitoring. So of course, one approach is through uh, capacity building through training workshops uh, and that sort of more opportunistic approach whenever we have requests from regions and countries, uh, given the availability of time, we do that capacity building. And uh, we already covered several countries and regions for that. And as one example to highlight, the immunization, the reports on the state of health inequality that came out last December uh, was the result of 20 months work with uh, Ministry of Health and different stakeholders in Indonesia based on their request. So we built the capacity on monitoring health inequality, mainly on data analysis and reporting data. And as a result of that, we had that comprehensive report, which was the first comprehensive joint report of WHO and a member state on a state of health inequality, which includes also a chapter on uh, inequality in immunization in Indonesia. And the similar thing basically could be done in other countries for which we have data. We also published the process of capacity building in Indonesia. So that's basically, we identified the success factors, the challenges, and how it could be replicable to other countries. Of course, the other approach that we take, because we cannot cover all the countries through capacity building, we have a systematic approach. So in 2013, we published a handbook on health inequality monitoring, which was based on previous experience of the training workshops we had in the countries. And we covered all components of health inequality monitoring with real examples from countries. Then we also produced uh, lectures, PowerPoint lectures, with speaker notes that are publicly available. Everything that I'm explaining are publicly available. Uh, for anyone who wants to get familiar or even use it for training, they can access these PowerPoints as well. Uh, in 2015, we also developed the e-learning module on health inequality monitoring based on the handbook with different application and exercises. So basically it's sort of a self-paced learning and the whole module can be done in four hour sitting. Last year, uh, we developed, we published a step-by-step -step manual on national health inequality monitoring uh, as a response to a request from countries that they wanted a less technical guideline for that. So through this manual, we actually identified different steps with different questions and items that need to be answered to develop a system for health inequality monitoring and incorporating that into the health information system of the countries with uh, references to the handbook and other useful references uh, that are more technical. And lastly, we developed uh, a toolkit, a health equity assessment toolkit that came out in 2016. And another version of that, uh, which uh, has the capacity for users to upload their own data came out basically last year. So uh, I'm going to now give you a live demonstration on health equity assessment toolkit heat. So you can see how that works and how we can interactively analyze health equity and report on that. 
Ahmed, could you maybe also answer this question? Like, how can we establish a relationship between equity and high risk population immunization coverage? Yeah, for answering that question, actually, it's not very clear to me that what, what is meant by that, because what, what we meant by high risk population immunization coverage. Uh, if I know that part, then, then I can answer that question. But the question so is maybe we can, ask, uh, we can ask the, the author of the question to, uh, to tell us um, if, uh, let me just find him in the list. Um, yeah, and <clears throat> so Mohammed Imran Qureshi is a WHO a scholar accompanist. Uh, Mohammed, can you hear us? And would you like to clarify your question for uh, Dr. Ahmed Reza? Uh, thank you very much, Reda. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And uh, no, thank you very much, Ahmed Reza and John. Uh, first of all, uh, really appreciable the efforts of uh, this webinars to address all such sensitive issues of immunization across the world and through the support of WHO headquarters. Thank you very much. So just uh, to clarify the question, mm -hmm. uh, the immunization coverage in the high risk population is always a challenge. Challenge by many means, mainly service delivery and you know, high risk population are of different varieties. Mainly they are those people who, who remain in movement like mobile high risk migratory populations, nomadic populations, like uh, the, the, the populations uh, who move for, for agri, agri uh, business and earnings and uh, some Brooklyn workers, something like that. And they, they, their immunization coverage is always a challenge. So mm -hmm. what, how we can relate this inequality with this uh, high risk population immunization coverage? Is there, is there a direct relationship between the two and uh, how we can like better understood and how we can like improve the situation in our own countries? That's basically when we refer to equity or inequality, that's basically the difference that we see between as you described high risk population and the low risk population. So that's sort of the definition of I mean, that also I want to emphasize on the previous question on inequality and inequity, because that also comes in many times that what's the difference between the two. So with inequality, within country inequality, we look at the observed difference between whatever the topic is, in this case, immunization coverage between different population subgroups, including high risk population and low risk population. And with inequity, basically is a subset of that inequality that is avoidable and it's unjust. So that's, that's the difference. So in that sense, what you're looking at or you're asking is basically when we talk about equity, we basically look at that difference between uh, high risk population and low risk population. So there are two parts to that. With monitoring, we measure that difference. And then the next step is that when we identify where are the inequalities or what are the population at risk with low coverage, then basically what are the drivers for that? So for that, we need to do research, quantitative and qualitative research to answer that question. And there is no single, quest, single answer to that because what drives that low coverage in high risk population could differ from one situation, one context to another, from one country, one district to another one. And even it may change from time to time. So that's why basically when we look at that and we explore, we look at the inequality and explore inequality, then the next step is basically to conduct research studies to see what explains that inequality or equity that exists or what explains the low coverage in the high risk population. I hope I answered your question. So I'm just continue to the uh, demonstration. Shall I share my yes. screen? Okay. So just one moment, I'm just sharing my screen now so you can see the toolkit here as well. Okay, 
so uh, I hope everybody can see the, the screen, uh, my screen. So that's the interface of the Health Equity Assessment Toolkit. And you're seeing the home page of that. So it's very simple. And basically in the home page that explains that the toolkit has a built-in database, which is the WHO Health Equity Monitor database that I've just explained. So the whole database is within the toolkit. And here you can see the toolkit has two main tabs, explore inequality and compare inequality. So in explore inequality, we basically look at the, we pick up one country of interest and we look at within country inequality in that country of interest. So what's the situation of inequality, latest situation of inequality and how inequality has changed over time. With compare inequality, we compare the situation of inequality in our country of interest with other similar countries. So that's the concept. So let's just start with explore inequality. So I'm clicking on that. And in the new page, you can see several components. So on the top here, you can see five sub tabs. Some of them looking at the aggregates of inequality. Both of them are quite important for analyzing and assessing inequality. With disaggregated data, we can look at uh, the pattern of inequality and get a full picture of the situation of the variation within the country. With summary measures of inequality, as the name uh, implies, they basically, those are the measures that summarize within country inequality into one number. So, in that sense, it's quite easy to compare the within country inequality using summary measures over time or compare inequality among different health indicators within countries or even compare the same indicator across different countries. So that's the advantage of summary measures. But of course, it has its disadvantage that it masks the variation. So it just shows one number. So that's why we always advise to use both disaggregated data and summary measures to get full picture of situation of inequality. In the left panel, so on the left panel, you can see that's our selector panel. So you can select from this left panel your country of interest. By default, that's Indonesia. You can select the data sources that we have in Health Equity Monitor database and select the year. And we can select also the health indicators that we have here. So there is a list of indicators that we can pick up from here. By default, that's BERT attended by skilled health personnel, but it has also immunization indicator that I can also show you later on. And we have those six dimensions of inequality that I explained to you. So let's look at the the visual that we see here. So in the visual, we can see by default, it's picked up Indonesia and four rounds of demographic and health survey for which we have publicly available data. We're looking at this aggregation of births attended by a skilled health personnel by economic status over time. So in the x-axis, we can see the coverage of a skill birth attendance. And in the y-axis, we can see the year of the survey. So looking at each line, each horizontal line, we can see five dots and each dot, each circle shows the coverage of a skill birth attendance in one of the wealth quintile, in one of the 20% population. So looking at the data, for example, picking up 1997, I can see that there is a big variation, a big gap between the poorest quintile and the richest quintile. The coverage in the poorest quintile is about 20%, meaning that only one verse out of five got basically a skilled personnel at the delivery. But in the richest quintile, we can see almost all the births got the skilled personnel at delivery. 
The good news here is that when we look at the data over time, the gap between the poorest and the richest has decreased significantly over time. So that's the good part of it. But bad news is that still there is a large gap that exists between the poorest and the richest even in 2012. And if you look at more closely, we can see the gap between the poorest quintile and the second poorest quintile actually has increased over time. So looking at 2012, that's the gap between the two lowest quintile. And in 2007, that's the gap. And we can see that increase of the gap. So basically the, the group that was most left behind is actually getting further, further behind from the other quintile. So that's the advantage of looking at disaggregated data. Let me add other indicators so we can actually look at further data in Indonesia. So I go to the select health indicators box, I click in and I type a keyword. So I'm picking up, for example, here we had maternal health indicator, skill birth attendance. I'm picking up now a reproductive health indicator, family planning. So I just type family planning and I can get two indicators here. I select one of them. And immediately we can see the visual appears here. Let's also pick up a childhood intervention indicator. So I pick up immunization for measles, for example. So I just type measles and I get the measles immunization indicator. So here we can now easily compare the situation. In family planning, we have a different story to say. The gap between poorest and richest was quite low in 1997. And even in the poorest quintile, the family planning was already 80% and the others were more. And that gap actually has decreased over time. So in 2012, the gap is much smaller, it's minimal. Immunization coverage has a different story. There is a large gap, not as large as skill birth attendance, as we see in 1997, but that gap hasn't decreased over time. So that sort of is stagnated. So we can see the gap between poorest and richest belt quintile remained almost the same over time. Also, we can see that gap again that we saw before between poorest quintile and second poorest quintile increased over time. So it's mainly that poorest quintile that uh, had less or a smaller increase in coverage. You can see the coverage has increased, but not as much as other middle uh, quintiles here. I can add also other dimensions of inequality. So let me add education and place of residence. So let's pick up the measles immunization coverage indicator. We already said the story about wealth-related inequality in immunization coverage, which was no change in wealth-related inequality. When we look at education-related inequality in immunization, we can see a different story. So the gap between non-educated mothers, the children coming from non-educated mothers, and the children coming from mothers with secondary uh, school plus has actually increased over time. So that's, that's another story that we can see here. When we look at urban-rural difference in immunization coverage, we can see the gap is a small and it got minimal over time. So that's a quick way of assessing inequality using disaggregated data across different indicators, basically. And here we can also uh, look at graph options. So if the fonts are small, I can increase, for example, the height. So the tool is very interactive. I can increase the widths. So things are very much clear in that sense. By default, the toolkit actually, as you see, picks up the name of the country and the, the data sources. But I can also change the title. So I can, for example, put inequality in Indonesia 
and I can put horizontal x axis title as basically here percentage and vertical axis title could be year. So all of them get reflected here. And then what I can do is that I can download the graph as PDF file or as an image. So I can easily then use them in a report that I'm preparing. So that's the, the way we can immediately get whatever we want and use it for communicating with different target audience. <laughs> I can also download the data using CSV file. So it's basically uh, very quickly, we can have the Excel file of the data that we can use here. Let's focus here. Yeah, just one moment. Don't even do that. Then. I will go back to your I'm not sure. Okay. Now can I move it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, you have to say what you want. Okay, this one. okay, sorry for the interruption. That's the uh, the case that we have in the like when it goes to online demonstration. I couldn't find the, the file. So in that sense, basically, uh, just demonstrating one of the tabs that we have here. And the other tabs could be functional the same as this one, basically. So we have disaggregated data using detail bar graph. So we can look at the situation when we have many subgroups. So let's say we have subnational region. In that sense, we can look at differences across subnational regions or districts. So in Indonesia, we have 33 provinces. And this way, we can look at the situation in the, in the districts. We can sort them by health indicator. We can sort them by dimension of inequality. I can pick up how I can sort it by, let's say, immunization coverage. And I can see, for example, in this case, when I sort it by immunization coverage, the province Papua has the lowest coverage and the Yogyakarta has the highest coverage. So let's go to the other tab to compare inequality, where we basically would like to look at uh, the situation of within country inequality in Indonesia and other countries, other similar countries. So here, basically, we have the same selection panel what we have here is that we also have the option to choose the countries. And from the options that we have, I can pick up, for example, low-income countries and, for example, Eastern Mediterranean, Western Pacific countries. And from the list, I can pick up any countries that, that interest to me. So I'm just picking up quickly all the countries that appears in the list. So. There is another option here is that how many years actually I would like to go back or come from from the survey year that I have. So my case, Indonesia, the survey comes from 2012. So by default, the toolkit picks up all the surveys uh, from 2010 to 2014, covering that two years difference. It can go to same year only. So here, as you can see, we're picking up only the surveys coming from 2012, or I can pick up maximum five years. So picking up the year from 2007 to 2017. Just looking at the visual and to see what's the importance of comparing inequalities basically here, when I look at Indonesia, and we already saw that there was a large inequality in 2012 between poorest and richest quintile. But when we put it into the context, when we do benchmarking, 
You can see there are countries like Lao, like uh, Afghanistan, like Timor Leste, Yemen, that has actually much larger inequality than Indonesia. On the other hand, there are countries like Jordan and Thailand where inequality is minimal or no inequality. So that's also the importance of doing benchmarking for uh, inequality. The toolkit comes with uh, lots of supporting materials, the technical notes, indicator compendium, and user manual, which explains everything in details and how the tool can be used. The heat is basically available in two uh, types, online version and also as a standalone version that can be downloaded and used on the machine, on Windows or Mac computers. That's the built-in database edition of the tool. And we also created the Heat Plus, which is the uploaded database edition of the tool, because we got many requests from the users, from the countries that, okay, that's the WHO database. If we have our own data, what can be done? So we developed Heat Plus where basically user can upload their own data as long as that complies to an Excel template that we provided in the toolkit. And then as long as the data is uploaded into the HEAT Plus, then the toolkit can calculate all the summary measures of inequality and can be used for assessing inequality exactly the same way, exactly with the same interface using looking at uh, summary measures, disaggregated data, and we can explore inequality and compare inequality. Uh, in the slide that Jan is going to show, uh, basically we provided also all the references in the last slide. So you can see in the slide that you get, in the PowerPoint slides, you have all the information about the health equity monitor and the references that we have there. So uh, that's a quick overview on the WHO work on health inequality monitoring and everything, as I said, are publicly available. And I understand that there was a two pager summary that I already shared with you that shows the summaries of each product and the link to each of them. So it can be accessible easily for further reference and exploration. Thanks very much. Good. All right, thank you very much, Ahmed Reza. I think there were a lot of comments uh, and a lot of interest for your presentation. So just to summarize, uh, the easiest way to explore this is the online version that you can mm -hmm. actually go to right now or after this webinar and uh, type in your country and see what's there. So it's actually an easy way to access a uh, coverage evaluation service. That's really what, what it is. Um, the other um, uh, things that you can do is, as, as Ahmed Reza explained, you can download it, you can then upload your own data and uh, do all these other analysis as well. So there were a lot of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to just take a little bit of time because we also are kind of uh, going a little bit over time, I think today, or uh, we only have half an hour left and there's so much uh, to be done. I think it would be great to actually at one point organize maybe a mini scholar course on, uh, on your heat tool and uh, health ec uh, equity monitoring. I think a lot of people are very interested in this. Um, so uh, just a few questions that were asked. Um, I think one person, Calvin, I think asked, um, this is only available every three to five years. So can we include this in the, in the routine uh, system? Uh, just to answer that maybe quickly for now, not really. It's not easy to do that, especially if you look at um, socioeconomic variables like wealth quintile. So in the administrative system, the reporting would become very complicated, but we are looking into okay. We are looking into ways. Do you want to reply yeah. that? Okay. Just a, a quick note on that is that basically uh, we developed heat plus for that reason. So using heat plus, the upload database edition of the tool, everybody can add, upload their own database. It doesn't matter the source of the data. It could be survey, could be admin data, could be CRBS, could be census, could be linked data. 
I mean, many countries, especially in high income countries, and also now many middle income countries are using linkage data, linking census data with facility data, with survey data. So that also could be uploaded in the heat plus. The other thing is that there is no limitation on the level. So it could be national level data, provincial, and district level or sub-district level data. And the other thing is, broadly speaking, HEAT Plus is even called Health Equity Assessment Toolkit Plus. It could be used for disaggregating any indicator by any dimension of, in of inequality. So it could be, for example, education by employment. So in that sense, the HEAT Plus has no limitation in terms of data sources, level of administration, and the type of the indicator and dimensions you're going to upload, as long as you comply to the Excel file that we provided as a template. Can maybe just clarifying and, and uh, just, this is a very uh, interesting, but also complex question. So I think the data that is, that we, I mean, technically it can be done, but the data that would need to come from the admin system is just not there because the data are not uh, labeled as kind of, uh, poor versus rich, or we don't disaggregate on, less le on that level. And for now, that's also not something that is very feasible to do. But of course, with new developments, like for example, electronic registries, it might become more feasible. We can also have like, as you say, these small area uh, linkages of kind of um, who lives in that area and link that to socioeconomic status. So there are things that we're exploring, but right now you're right, we're actually limited to using survey data mostly for this as a source for this analysis. Um, I think somebody else, uh, Kevi Situ, I hope I pronounced that a little bit okay, uh, asked that um, immunization is free, so why would this be uh, an uh, effect equity? So yes, immunization is free, uh, but we do see still that uh, poor people have just much less access to the, um, to, the, to the health system. There might also be kind of things that play like uh, uh, social distance. So for example, marginalized population, different ethnicities who uh, don't necessarily uh, trust the government or the government has no, no good uh, relationship with them. Uh, and finally, for example, even slum dwellers, for example, who uh, are poor, well, they need to work. They can't bring their uh, kids to the uh, clinic at four o'clock in the afternoon. So that creates all these barriers to immunizations that we need to understand better, but we know they're there. We can see it from the data. Um, so that's for that question. And this is actually very well related to a lot of the other questions that people asked in the chat or in the Q&A, which are about um, the dropouts and the left outs. So who are the left outs and the dropouts and what does it mean for us? So very simply said, uh, if you have a lot of left outs, um, these are the kids that never access the system in the first place. So the zero dose kids. So either there's kind of uh, physical distance or social distance or mistrust or maybe hesitancy for vaccination. Um, but anyway, people that we don't seem to connect to the health facility. So that's a really hard uh, problem to solve. And somebody asked, how can we monitor it? Uh, very difficult to do that. So we use denominators uh, to think, okay, how many people are in the country? How many people do we reach? and the difference are the ones that we don't reach. Uh, but it's very difficult to do that because the, um, the, the difficulties with denominators, of course, we have. Uh, there's other ways like GIS and stuff that we can try to do, but um, we'll have a webinar actually dedicated to that only. Uh, so dropout is a very different issue. Dropout means that people come, so the hard part is done, mm -hmm. but then somehow they uh, don't complete the schedule. So then we have to ask ourselves, are there service issues? Uh, when they come back, um, maybe there was no vaccine there, or maybe they were not well treated and they decide not to come back, or maybe there was an AFI that was not well attended to and they decide to drop out. So it's, a, a, it's kind of more a service quality issue rather than a service access issue. Um, this is a little bit described in the handbook, which you find in uh, the resource folder under webinar one. So there's a handbook on monitoring and it's kind of a little bit described there. Um, and then high dropout rate, I, well, I reply to that. 
Um, so maybe I think we should uh, continue with the slides because we only have 20 minutes left. So let's do that. We have a few important things still to say. Yes. Yeah, just a, just a point of order. We, we will be making a hard stop at the halfway mark because we have the, uh, and I see some Francophones may have gotten confused and joined the English uh, web, uh, webinar. Uh, at the halfway mark, we'll be um, okay. kicking off another uh, session of the uh, Survey Scholar course in French. Okay. So... Uh, now that we looked at all this data, I wanted to just to answer a few questions like, uh, and the questions are, how do we know that this is true? Where do we get the data from? Um, well, just to say that all the member states uh, send reports such as annual country reports, the joint reporting form, for example. Um, we also find periodic coverage surveys that are shared by countries or that we actually find through DHS uh, mixed partnerships. Um, Countries send their monthly case-based uh, vaccine preventable disease data for certain priority diseases, such as measles and rubella. And ad hoc, there will also be the polio data. If there's a case of polio, uh, wild or vaccine derived, we will know about that uh, right away. So that is straight ahead. And then these arrows um, in the middle, there's a bit of a sausage factory. So we kind of analyze that, we clean that, we, we triangulate that, uh, we make the runic estimates. Um, and we use those uh, actually to inform all these things like uh, the GVAP community, uh, the polio, GPI, um, the, uh, Ahmed Reza mentioned uh, the, the sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, Gavi uses that, uh, WHO of course uses that, and the Measles and Rebellion Initiative, amongst others. So there's all these uh, global initiatives that uh, use that kind of data that you share for surveillance and for monitoring of programs. There's a few things I want to, this, to explain. So there was a question, what is the joint reporting form? Uh, lucky enough, I have a slide for that. It's, a, it's called joint because it's a joint between WHO and UNICEF. It's a very complicated way of how we get it and collate it. And it's kind of a little bit a political uh, or kind of historical uh, artifact that it goes through all these country offices and regional offices. Uh, but in the end, it's the way that we find out from programs uh, what their numbers are annually about vaccine preventable disease cases about coverage, whether that's administrative and official, uh, the vaccination schedule, the prices for vaccines that people pay, system indicators and supplementary activities, so SIAs. Um, one thing I want to explain, explain here is when countries tell us what their administrative coverage is, they also have the option to say, well, this is the administrative system. But apart from that, we have an official estimate, which might be different for some reason, because we look at our service and we have like a different approach. So we don't say it's 120%. We think it's only 85%, for example. Uh, the vaccine prices we collect and we share with everybody just to find, to try to gain some market power uh, against the manufacturers so that um, we, if we all know what everybody's paying for vaccines, we can actually use that in our negotiation with uh, manufacturers. So that's the joint reporting form. Um, and actually this year is a 20 year joint report form. So we have a bit of a anniversary anniversary uh, if you still have your menti.com ready um, how many uh, member states do you think did not send a joint report form this year is it uh, zero one five twelve or thirty so the first option is did all member states report this year uh, did only one not report five not report twelve or thirty and i won't keep this too much time because uh, time is running out and as uh, Reda said it's a hard stop um, but yes, actually, we always had a situation that Monaco would never send a joint reporting form. And this year they did send us a joint reporting form. So the correct answer is zero. We have all the member states reporting this year, no. which is quite amazing. Um, what are the runic? Uh, the runic is a bit of a sausage factory. I put a PDF in the Dropbox that I mentioned before that explains exactly what the rules and uh, regulations are and the process. But really what RUNIC does is they look, they look at uh, what countries report, so their administrative coverage, as well as their official coverage, and they compare that, they triangulate that to the survey coverage. Then we take contexts, for example, stockouts, uh, global level or national level, uh, and expert opinion into account, and that goes into the sausage factory and, and we get some estimates. So the estimates are then what is being used for global uh, monitoring. Um, where do we hide the data? I think we have uh, 15 more minutes. So I'm just going to show this very quick uh, and then still try to take a few questions. Uh, four boxes here. So uh, four places I wanted to point you to. 
So we have a WHO immunization website, and I put uh, the name of the uh, URL to that website there. Uh, the Global Health Observatory, where we find all the data, but not as detailed maybe as for, for each program. We have a UNICEF immunization website, and we have some other uh, websites that also publish uh, immunization data. So first of all, the WHO immunization website, let me just actually quickly go there and uh, show you. actually might need to actually minimize this. Okay, this is WHO data website where we have all the data and statistics in one easy page for you to access. So everything that was on the list there. Two things I wanted to point out is first of all, um, on that global website, we have uh, all information available by WHO member states. So if you click on this link, you will actually be see you can actually see all the data that is there for one country. I clicked on Afghanistan, right? And you will see all the data. It's not very uh, pretty, but it's all there. Uh, you also see some, you can also see some graphs there that are included um, together with the numbers and you can download the data as CVS and Excel also. Just to say that this might be interesting for you to look at. Um, all right, let me go back. Uh, I also wanted to show that there's an app. So we have a free immunization summary application for tablets and phones that you can download. And then you have the world's immunization data at your fingertips on your phone. It's available in iOS and Android. I talked about this. Uh, the Global Health Observatory, it's very nice. It's very pretty, but it's sometimes hard to find things in there. Uh, so I find things by Googling it. I just wanted to show two things. First of all, uh, people asked before, can we also see, uh, for example, the, the do these punch cards exist also for the African region? Yes, they do exist for the African region. Here it is. They exist for all regions and all countries. And here's where you can actually find them. And here also there's a little text on how to interpret uh, this uh, graph. The subnational data are also there. Um, here we have Bangladesh. As you see, Bangladesh has most of its districts have coverage over 100%, uh, which is probably a data quality issue and an issue with the denominator. Um, but that's also there and all the URLs are in the website, in, in the presentation. Um, just to say that UNICEF has a very nice website. It's a bit more, uh, less data, but more clean. So you can actually have a map here that shows all the cohorts of unimmunized or the estimates of the unvaccinated children by uh, country in the world. Uh, you can also see on this uh, website uh, immunization coverage data visualization. So like uh, some kind of, um, it's actually also made in China, just shining just like a heat, uh, but some kind of uh, tool that you can use to look at the global data. And it's, I'm not going to play around with this because we don't have a lot of time, but just to show it's there. Um, and you can also look at the, uh, at the runic estimates, for example, here, which is also, by the way, on the WHO page, but I'll open it here. Uh, the immunization country profiles here that will lead you to the um, uh, to the runic. So let me again take Afghanistan, for example, just show you how it works. We understand it's quite hard to interpret uh, runic, uh, but just basically to say how it works, because people before asked me how it worked, and I will ask, answer that question now. Um, the way it works is that here we show all the data that are collected. So the, all the administrative data in stars, all the official estimates in bubbles and all the survey estimates or the survey outcomes in bars. So what this committee then does is they look at all this data and they make decisions based on a rule set that they have. And I put a PDF that explains the rules in the resource folder. Now the blue line are then the winning that are based on in this case surveys because the administrative numbers are not uh, trusted in this case. Um, what you will find here, apart from this table and uh, the graph, are an explanation here of exactly what decision was taken and why. And basically, if you doubt that decision, here at least you can find why this decision was the way it was. Sometimes it is because uh, the difference is just too big or sometimes it was because the denominator was adjusted from one year to the other and then we won't uh, trust that as well. Um, right. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show you too is like if um, 
in the category of others, I put DHS and DHS uh, does a lot of the service. And of course, just to highlight that this year, a few years ago, they started putting model service estimates. So they kind of take all the DHS data, the cluster outcomes, and what they will do is kind of, they will uh, show all the indicators. Uh, and this is DTP, for example, for Myanmar, and they will have like an estimate of um, where coverage is high and low. And uh, a little bit unintuitively, red is very good and yellow is bad. So more, the more red it is, the more coverage there is. Uh, what you see here is, for example, that um, for measles, for example, in Myanmar, you see you have very high coverage, apart from in this uh, northern region here, um, according to that uh, model. Something to play around that might be interesting. Um, so that was it for uh, the data. I don't, so we have 10 more minutes uh, for questions. So Reda, if you want to uh, highlight maybe the most asked questions and we'll try to answer that. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Jan, Jan and uh, Ahmed Reza. So, um, so there is a question um, with the most votes, uh, you've explained a lot of things in relation to it, but just to get a short summary in response to uh, uh, question, we don't see the person's name, we only see the name of his device. How is w How are WHO UNICEF estimates done? Uh, yes, um, so to be honest, like it, there's uh, too much explanation that can be done. There's a number of rules that say exactly what should be done. But when I showed you that, um, that funnel, so we put in three elements basically. We put in uh, administrative coverage, we put in official coverage and the survey coverage and we add context to that. And then there's an expert committee that looks at the rules that are there, are described, and then makes decisions that are uh, then reflected in those PDFs that you have seen. Uh, so this is basically how it is. I, I can't really uh, use much more. I think Marta said we could actually actually do a webinar just to explain how Runic works. Uh, Runic is quite a uh, controversial thing because uh, what it means is that member states will report some data and we will then either accept it or not. Uh, and we're forced to, we would actually like, what we would like is these official estimates to be quite precise and take into account a lot of information, for example, from service, so that we don't have to do adjustments. Now, what that takes is a lot of country level capacity building and, and uh, empowerment uh, to, for them to actually look at all this, these sources and kind of use apply a little bit of the same rules to come up with an official estimate that we then just can can take on board. Right, thank you, Yeah. Uh, another, que yeah mm -hmm. uh, another question from Dr. Halid Abubakar. Uh, can we use the health equity assessment toolkit at sub-national level? What is the main source of data for health equity, DVDMT or HMIS for routine immunization? Yes, yes, of, yes, yes, as I explained, it can be used at any administrative level as long as we have the right data for that. So let's say in a district, we had immunization data disaggregated by any dimension. We can, it can be uploaded to HEAT Plus and then the whole assessment could be done through HEAT Plus. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, now, there is a question, uh, I'm trying to understand it, from Ibrahim El Anessi um, mm -hmm. about inequity. Um, mm -hmm. Jan, have you looked at that one? Uh, so Ibrahim says, most of the poor people are low education. The rumors are going and spread between them so fast that there are many refusals. Supporting social mobilization is not the correct solution always because they also do not trust the government and agencies. Also, monitoring equity is too difficult. So two questions, how is that applied in the other countries? And two, what is the best solution for monitoring and also to reach these poorest people? So quite a broad question, but I don't know if uh, either of you can, can provide some elements of response. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Uh, of course, that's also quite important. I mean, I haven't seen that in the, in the quiz, but education is also, mother's education is one of the most important factors that associated with immunization coverage. And if you're interested, you, you're welcome to look at our latest report, Exploration of Inequality uh, in Immunization, that we've done in 10 priority countries, uh, which had the uh, highest number on unvaccinated children. 
where we actually we looked at uh, the joint effect of different factors like we use basically a modeling logistic regression modeling to look at to see what are the pure associations of each of these factors education wealth quintile urban rural birth order and so on with uh, immunization coverage with DTP immunization coverage meaning that basically we control for the other factors when we looked at the association of for example education and immunization coverage we controlled and we kept the other factors associations fixed so and it turns out that in almost all the countries the two factors that are playing major role is basically economic status and education of course we need to add the fact that the regional differences or sub-national regional differences also played a major role in all those 10 countries but basically what we came out in the report and that's quite important for uh, making decision is that we come up with the idea of compound vulnerability advantage, meaning that if, for example, a child belongs to a teenage mother, non-educated, coming from poorer family, living in an uh, underserved area, what's the chance of getting vaccinated comparing to a child coming from non-teenage mother, highly educated, coming from rich family and living in a like uh, a highly structured area. So we did that sort of analysis. And for example, in Nigeria, as one example that we picked up, that difference was about 300 times. So basically the advantage group had 300 times more chance of getting vaccinated for DPT3 immunization comparing to the example for most disadvantage. Yeah. I just right. also wanted to add a little bit to that because I think the, um, the question is not just about how do you monitor, but also like how do you react to that and the programmatic response can be different at some point. I think in this case, uh, the answer, I mean, whoever um, asked the question knows quite a lot about the situation already, knows exactly what the weaknesses are. Uh, what you now need to do is try to understand the root causes of those situations. And you're totally right, social mobilization and education is not always the answer. Uh, the first step is really to, to talk to those people and those groups and have more of a qualitative understanding of what is really holding them back from being vaccinated. So monitoring only goes so far. The next step is then going deep into that implement actions that we don't know always what the right actions are and then uh, see how these actions have worked. Um, just to say that while we're wrapping up, I kind of uh, show this slide with kind of your appreciation of the webinar. If you can please just fill it in and just after we do that, I'll go to a different slide that has some suggestions for how we can improve uh, next webinars uh, topic wise or, um, or organization wise. Um, there's also a few questions here that I just wanted to quickly answer. What is the status of the GVAP? It's pretty bad. Uh, we are failing on everything apart from new vaccine introduction. Um, there are big reports about that, but we are not, uh, and we are not going to reach also coverage targets or elimination targets, uh, but we have like introduced a lot of vaccines. Uh, district between the quality, uh, between quality of data in DHS2 and district data. So just to say that the data we showed comes from DHIS2. If that is what the country uses, it might also come from DVDMT or something like that, if that is what the country uh, use. Uh, Reda, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Jan and Ahmed Reza. Uh, many uh, comments uh, praising uh, your presentations uh, for their quality, uh, for their relevance, and many thank yous uh, from the uh, uh, from the group. Uh, a few comments uh, people point out again uh, that we've packed a lot of information into this single session. So I want to highlight that the recording will be available uh, together with, uh, and the resources we've already shared the, uh, the link prepared by Jan Grevendog so you can have access to them right away. So thank you. And uh, there will be the, another uh, webinar. Perhaps Jan, you want to give the next, uh, the, the next uh, date and time for the next English language webinar. And there is for the Francophones listening in, there is uh, uh, in principle uh, going to be an equivalent webinar in French on each of the topics uh, and those will be announced separately. 
Yeah, so the next, uh, I can tell you the topic, uh, but you can maybe say the date and time because I wasn't exactly sure what we agreed upon, but the topic for the next webinar, I'll say the next two webinars, the next one will be about data use, the data use culture, which is very important, but we don't know how to uh, improve that. So we will hear from uh, CDC colleagues, uh, from WHO colleagues, uh, PAV and JSI, actually quite a lot of presenters this time. We will hear about uh, specific ideas on how to improve uh, data use cultures and capacity for using immunization data. So that is going to be, did we agree next Wednesday or next Thursday, uh, Reda? So that, that, that would be Wednesday. Wednesday at um, yeah. 11. Yes, so, so at 11 Geneva. We'll be sharing the full program as soon as we've locked down the dates. We're trying to make sure if Jan is, is, uh, is you know, doing everything he can to get the best presenters for each of these sessions to make these worth your time. Okay. Great. Thank you. And in one minute, we'll be starting the next uh, discussion group. So thank you for your attention and for the Francophones joining the uh, Survey Scholar discussion. See you in about a minute. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.